let's just jump right into cross hedging here because that's where we are. But before we do that, I want to introduce the concept of the hedge ratio. And the hedge ratio is basically the size of the position in futures that you're taking uh, over the size of the exposure. It's just the ratio of the two. If you have a policy of hedging out 100% of your price risk and the asset that you have exposure to has a futures contract, you'll have a hedge ratio of 1. And hedge ratio is denoted as H, may equal 1. However, not all companies have a policy of hedging 100% of their price risk. Uh, farmers, for example, do not follow the 100% uh, ratio. They'll hedge 60 to 70% of their exposure uh, with a futures contract. And the reason is uh, because um, at the beginning of a season, farmers know how many acres they're going to plant. And they know what the average yield per acre is, but they do not know what growing conditions are going to be. So if growing conditions are terrible, their yield per acre will drop significantly. So if they sell forward 100% of their crop at the average yield of, let's say, 135 bushels per acre, uh, and we'll go with corn, and it's a bad harvest and they only realize 115 bushels per acre on average, well, they're short. And if they sold it forward, tough, they got to deliver, which means they'll have to go in the spot market and buy at the higher price and deliver on the futures contract at a lower price. So by only hedging 60 to 70% of their price risk, they still have 30 to 40% price risk exposure, but it's a fair trade-off because of the risk of hedging 100% and not being able to deliver on an uncertain growing season. So there's another element of risk. So... The hedge ratio need not be one all the time. Now, this is a hedge ratio where the asset of the futures contract is the same as that of the exposure. Well, what happens when the asset that you have exposure to does not have a futures contract and you have to use another asset underlying the futures contract to hedge out? That's called cross hedging. And that hedge will be affected by the correlation between the target and the futures asset. So if you have a policy of 60 to 70% hedging and they're the same asset, the correlation between different assets would change the 60 to 70% ratio to reflect the correlation uh, being less than perfect. So how do we figure that out? How do we get to, I want, let's say 100%, I want to hedge out 100% of my risk, but these are different assets. How do I determine what my hedge ratio is now that I don't have perfect correlation? Well, there is a way to do it, and it's done statistically. But as we all know, when you do things statistically, it introduces its own level of risk. So let's have a look at what we need to get that done. We need some series, some, some data series. So we need a series of price changes. We need a series of changes in the spot price and changes in the futures price over the same period of time for a number of periods. And each period of time must have an equal time to the life of the hedge. So if it's a two-month hedge we're, we're putting on, our time series should be a series of two-month observations. So that means that going back one year, we should be able to get six observations on the change in the spot and six observations on the change in the future. So if we need 30 observations, we're going back five years in time. Understand that that might not be realistic, especially for uh, uh, agriculture, especially for livestock, especially for any of those things where some variables are simply out of your control. Uh, so it may not be appropriate to go back that far in time uh, for changes in price, which means you may have to say, well, if you have a six-month hedge, you certainly can't get enough observations over six-month periods. You might have to say, well, we're going to have to change that to two-month periods or one-month period and understand that the change in the spot versus the change in the future, the average change does not reflect the average change of the life of the hedge. So there is that little risk that you have to be aware of. The second condition... Uh, that you have to follow is these must be non-overlapping time periods. I've had some students say, well, why don't you just do a six-month hedge and then go back one day and do that six-month and then go back one day and take that observation so that you end up with a moving average. 
uh, of the average of the price change. Well, that introduces a whole bunch of issues uh, that I don't want to get into now, but if you've taken econometrics, you know that introduces a whole bunch of statistical issues uh, that could bias your estimates. So here we are. Once we have all of these, we plot them. Clearly, you've taken some time to think about the asset uh, that you have exposure to and the futures asset, and you haven't just picked two at random, but you've picked two that you know have some kind of relationship, maybe not a perfect relationship, but they have some sort of relationship that can be plotted linearly and using regression, come up with some line of best fit. Right, so there we're just using statistics at this point, and if you're at this level of this course, you've You've obviously been through a course on statistics. I'm not going to explain it. Anyways, if we can conceive of our change in S being Y and our change in the futures price being X, what we have here is we have a relationship of Y is alpha plus beta X plus some error term. Hopefully the error terms will be as small as possible. And the slope of this line is our new hedge ratio. The slope of the line will be the hedge ratio. So, to see how that uh, how that works out, this is it right here. Our beta becomes our new hedge ratio, and we'll denote it H star to represent cross hedging. So, let's follow along and see if we can figure out how to calculate the formula for this from the beginning. If our correlation between the spot and the futures is one, we're up here. We have a hedge ratio where where the position in the futures is the same as the exposure. The assets are the same. However, the price change need not be the same. We could have a standard deviation uh, on the spot price that is different from the standard deviation of the futures price, and that would change the head ratio even though they're correlated by one, even though they are. Now, if they are the same asset, that would be rare. But let's say we found two assets that are different, but still have a correlation of one. Again, statistically, you'd argue they're the same thing if they have a correlation of one. But let's just let's just work with me. And let's say that the standard deviation of the price change in the spot is two times that of the futures contract. You'd need a hedge ratio of two. And what this is saying is to hedge out an asset that moves twice as much in price as the futures contract, you'd need two futures contracts just to negate this. Does that make sense? You'd need two futures contracts just to negate that. Okay, great. So we can see that H is the ratio of the standard deviation of the spot price to the standard deviation of the futures price. However, when we cross hedge, it's affected by the correlation between the two. So we have to adjust this formula for cross hedging to reflect the fact that the correlation will affect this ratio. There you go. So the ratio, so now the cross hedging hedge ratio is a function of the correlation, the coefficient of correlation between the two assets multiplied by the ratio of their uh, dispersion. And as you know, variance and standard deviation are measures of risk. And this is what we're doing. We're measuring risk here. So this is called the minimum, minimum variance hedge ratio. Now that's a big, big, long explanation for what this is, right? And that's a long title for a variable, a minimum variance hedge ratio. Well, we know what a hedge ratio is, right? So for the hedge ratio part, we're okay. But how do we call, why do we call this a minimum variance? I understand that this is a line of best fit, it's least squares, but why is this called minimum variance? Well, I'm going to explain that next.